I, I saw where it went to women who had all these kids, their homes were um, tiny because they couldn't go into debt. That's another thing Bill Gothard taught. So you're living in this tiny house. You have to have as many kids as possible and you're stuck there. So how are you feeling? I know we're just a, a few, like a week or so away for the book coming out, but how are you feeling about it? And you know, what's kind of your thought process going into this one? I'm really excited that we are so close to book launch. Um, it's been definitely a challenging process to write this book, but as I've said before, like it's, it's the most important thing I've ever done. And so I'm really excited for this book to be out there in the reader's hands. And I'm just hoping that it helps someone, even just one person who has been in a setting that I was in or something similar um, where they followed a teacher who claimed to speak for God, but didn't. And hopefully they can come to freedom as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what makes you the most anxious or maybe the most nervous for people to reveal and for people to kind of get to know you on a different level? Mm -hmm. I think in this book, I've been more open and vulnerable than I ever have before. And so that's something that I know um, I have a healthy respect for, like when I put something out and how it can be handled. Um, but at the same time, I think my heart going into this has been to share stories I haven't shared before because I think that a lot of readers will be able to relate to it even if they did not grow up in the exact same setting as I did. Um, hopefully my vulnerability will be able to help someone. Yeah, was this process able to help you even more? Was this a therapeutic and cathartic experience for you? It was. It was definitely stressful at times writing this book just because I think the community I grew up in was so tight knit and I had, you know, um, I was kind of fearful at times thinking it's tough to speak out, but um, it was very therapeutic for sure because I was able to walk through, walk back through a lot of those teachings and um, it also showed me how far I've come and how much I've grown. And it was a beautiful journey, really, being able to walk through it, even though it was so hard. Um, I'm grateful that I was able to do this. Definitely. I think in the book, you say fear best described your younger self. What is the best word to describe you right now? Man, I would say free. <laughs> I have so much freedom and peace, um, peace with God, really, because I think I had wrestled with fear for so many years and I wasn't sure why or what the source of that fear was. And once I was able to figure out, okay, I think this teaching is making me fearful because Bill Gothard would say, the teacher we followed, he would tell us that, um, like if you step outside of a box, you don't know God has for you. God is waiting to smite you or punish you for that. Um, and if you're not following Bill Gothard's principles, his teaching, uh, he said that your life will be one disaster after another. So I would be gripped with fear thinking, okay, am I pleasing to God? I don't know what God expects of me. And so I would be so terrified to like even go play sport with my siblings. Maybe I'm supposed to stay home and read my Bible for hours and hours. I'm not sure. So that kind of fear did cripple me um, as a young, young teen. Right. I mean, I can't imagine the amount of pressure you must have been under as well. Like not only the fear, but the pressure that like you're constantly maybe doing something wrong. I mean, when did you come to the realization like this is not how I want to live? Or was there like this like aha moment where something happened that you just were like, I can't do this anymore? It was interesting. I do feel like there was that mm -hmm. aha moment um, for me because um, I had talked with uh, Jeremy, he, my, my now husband, he had grown up in a different setting, totally outside of my world. And he came on the scene and our dad told us, okay, before you guys can move forward in your relationship, listen to some of these teachings. So Jer was listening to like 60 plus hours of Bill Gothard's teaching, which was actually the most helpful thing because the, he started listening to some was kind of like, huh, oh, this is interesting. Like, what is this? Having no clue who Bill Gothard was. So the further into the teaching he got, he started to realize really fast how damaging it was and how fear-based it was. It was not based in the Bible 
even though Bill Gothard claimed it was. So it, it was interesting. We started watching these seminars from Bill Gothard together and just pausing them and talking and discussing. And Jeremy would be like, did you hear that he said? Like, he said that was in the Bible. It's not like, did you hear that? And so basically challenging me to think for myself because I had always thought like, what's the right answer? Like, don't question this. And, um, and he was just challenging me like, think through this, think for yourself. And if it's true, it'll stand up for itself. If it's not, it'll just fall apart. So basically I started to see that these teachings were not grounded in truth. And that's really what brought me freedom. Yeah. Did did you, I think you said it before that it it felt almost like a cult like environment. Now looking back on it, do you still feel the same way? Yes. I definitely think it was cult like in many ways. Um, I think the fear, it was built on fear, manipulation, control, and superstition. So all those things combine and how hard it is for kids to leave or adults to leave anyone really. Mm -hmm. Um, It's so tough because the community, it's okay for like other Christians outside to do things differently because they haven't heard the teachings yet. But once you hear the teachings, you're not supposed to depart from those. Right. I mean, how does the rest of your family feel about this? How did they feel about when they read this book? Was there a lot of um, things that opened their eyes to maybe different beliefs and uh, and values and things like that? So I had sought to be like open with my family, different ones at different points. But um, I remember initially, like when I started wearing pants, that was like a huge thing. And so I wanted to share with my family. I felt like it was the most loving thing to do to share. Hey, this is why I see this as um, in the word of God differently than I used to. And so we talked through those things and the same with this book. When I decided to write this book, I had been writing some, um, for just a short bit, but then I shared that, um, with my family and some of them were, um, really excited to read. Others may have been like, okay, you're going to write this book, but I'm not sure what it's about and how are you going to tell this story? But my, my perspective through this has been, okay, I want to tell it in a way that's winsome, hopefully, but also speaking truth very boldly and clearly and saying this was harmful. These teachings were dangerous. And, um, I'm hoping that even friends and loved ones will read it and will say, okay, I I can see how you come to that conclusion or those perspectives based on the Bible. And, um, hopefully it will be helpful. Mm -hmm. What do you think should have happened to Bill Gother? Because obviously he decided to resign. There was not just the dangerous teachings, but the dangerous practices as well. He had all these women and girls around him all the time. I mean, what do you feel like should have happened to him? And what? where is he right now? Mm. I'm not exactly sure where Bill Gothard is right now. Um, I know that it was it was so, so sad because... 30 plus women came and um, had accusations against him and um, took that, you know, to the justice system and all. But I think time had already elapsed and it wasn't possible for anything to be nailed down. And so it's it's really sad and heartbreaking. And at the same time, I think me looking at this now, I'm saying, okay, I want to speak up even though it's so difficult because like those those women did, they were brave and bold. And I want to take a stand as well and say this was terribly wrong in, in so, so many ways. Definitely. Do you feel like you're completely healed from the trauma that you went through during that time? Mm. I think that this process has been long. And so I'm still, I mean, if I said, oh, I'm perfectly right. fine, like <laughs> that's not always, I think, this journey is continuing every day. And so this disentangling, as I said, like it's my perspective of my life, the world around me, um, God's word. I want my life to be based on God's word because I'm a Christian who loves Jesus, but that's going to look different than I did before. But that's just going to take years to walk through. And there are days where fears will come back and try to grip me. And I'll just have to think on what's true and remember that, um, I was taught a lot of those things that are still going to come back and try to be my thought process, but not allowing it to be. Definitely. You know, what what was interesting is that you talk about how even your views changed when it comes to being a wife, when it came to being a mother, when it came to sexuality and things like that. So tell me like a little bit about your views now on that as well. Mm. Yeah, I think that um, 
Bill Gothard taught for so many years that um, women have to stay inside the home. And so whether or not you're 40 years old, you should live with your parents and not work outside of the home unless you're working at his headquarters, which is just so ironic, right? Like there's, um, you're allowed to do that. So I had that perspective in mind as well as that I would have as many kids as um, God would give me, meaning no birth control at all. Um, and that was something that I thought was my future. And even though now I'm married and I have two beautiful girls, four and two, um, my life looks totally different than I thought it would. My husband, Jeremy has been so supportive. And also like he's told me, like, if you have any passions, hobbies, anything you want to do, like, I want to make that happen for you. So he has encouraged me to grow, mm -hmm. to get outside of my little box of thinking. And it's been really sweet to see because I think there's a balance in that. Being a mom is, it's the best thing. Like I love it so much. And at the same time I realized, okay, my younger years, I thought that, um, that was my only identity as I got older. So for people who can't have kids, who struggle with infertility, like what kind of, you know, pressure is put upon you? Who are you supposed to be if you can't have kids in, in Bill Gothard's setting? So those types of things really weighed on me. And I also wasn't the type of person who was like, oh, give me all of your kids to babysit them. I will do that. Like that really wasn't me, but I also still thought, okay, this is for sure. Um, I'm gonna have probably 19 kids if I get married young. Um, so my perspectives changed on that, realizing, okay, children are a blessing from the Lord, but everything that's a blessing from God, mm -hmm. how many, how much do you have to have of it? So food's a blessing, you know, cars are a blessing, <laughs> like everything. So how much do you have to have of it? And, um, that mindset of like it, it being, I, I saw where it went to women who had all these kids, their homes were um, tiny because they couldn't go into debt. That's another thing Bill Gothard taught. So you're living in this tiny house. You have to have as many kids as possible and you're stuck there. And I think that was something I saw that was heartbreaking in that system. And that's another reason why I want to speak out um, on this topic, because I see it was so harmful. Yeah. Do you think that the pressure that you felt or the fear that you felt may have also contributed to your eating disorder? Because you do talk a lot about that as well. Do you feel like that they kind of went hand in hand at times? At times, yes. I'd say that the fear that I felt with my eating disorder, it was, I was so consumed with being a certain way. And I think that a lot of young girls wrestle with that, even if they're not in that setting, but definitely in that setting, I could feel it even more mm -hmm. because I was already struggling with fear. And so I would lean into that and um, it was such a difficult time. And I'm just so grateful it was short lived that I was able to get help. And my mom helped me to walk through a lot of that too, because she, um, as she's publicly said before, she had that same um, issue. Hers was even worse. And she was very gracious and caring and kind with me in those those many um, months. Definitely. What's your relationship like now with food and body image? Are you completely healed from that? And how do you view that? And how do you also teach? I mean, I know your daughters are young, but how do you how are you preparing to teach them about body positivity in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that thankfully today I'm in a really good place. Mm -hmm. I definitely eat healthy because I see that as important. I try to feed my family healthy food and I love to work out. But at the same time, um, I also know that my identity is not wrapped up in a uh, number on the scale. And so my perspectives have shifted. I've gone through postpartum twice and, you know, I gained 40 pounds with each pregnancy. And that was something that I think in those times, it was harder for me to think through. I have to think through truth and think, okay, this is not um, a time I'm not going to be dieting. Like I'm going to eat healthy, but I'm not doing any of that. And it was really good for me to walk through that because I saw my body go through so many changes and that even in itself, it showed me the strength of women and your own body being able to do that. It's a miracle. And then coming back after that, it took me, you know, I didn't 
rush around to lose the weight. I was comfortable with that. And that was even another huge thing just to show me how far I've come mm -hmm. because I was okay with having that mom body after I had the kids. And it was like that for a year, a year and a half after having the kids, you're not back to normal. And that's something that I've become more okay with. But also at the same time, I realized, okay, I know it's easy. You could fall back into that. So I want to keep my mindset right and be balanced with nutrition, be balanced with how I view myself and not thinking too much about my outward appearance. And I want to exemplify that for my girls too, because I know that the culture around us is so focused on being a certain way, looking a certain way. And I don't want my girls to have to walk through the same things I did and have those same pressures on them. So I'm definitely gonna wanna talk to them about that. The older they get, they're still very young right now. Mm -hmm. um, but that's definitely conversations I wanna have. Definitely, I know you talk about your postpartum depression a little bit in the book. How difficult was that for you? And did you experience that both times or were after both pregnancies, was it completely different for you? It was completely different, both yeah. pregnancies. With Felicity, I did not have any postpartum depression. With Evie Jo, I was, it was a bit after, which was so surprising because um, I realized like I had been nursing her and it was something that I realized, okay, it's just, I am done with that. Even though I wanted to give her nutrition, I still was like totally done, just really sad and like having all of the blues. And I was like, what's wrong with me? And I didn't even think it was postpartum depression until I talked to someone and they, they encouraged me like, okay, stop breastfeeding, um, put her on a bottle, do all these things. And thankfully, I know it's not the same for everyone, but for me, like those stages helped. And eventually, like after a couple months, I felt like I just came out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just getting help and figuring out, okay, I need to be open and talk because you feel so isolated and feel like, man, what's wrong with me? I don't know what's happening. And that's scary. But I was able to come through that time. And now if other people are, other moms are struggling with that, um, I want to be open and vulnerable and talk about that time. Definitely. No, it is. It's such an isolating and lonely time that like, unless you're going through it, you don't really know because you're, you know, you're the sole food source for your baby. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. It's a lot of pressure. It really is. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I know I'm sure you probably get this question all the time, but do you guys want to expand your family even more in the future when I mean, you have a beautiful family, but do you want to do it? You want to do it again? <laughs> we'll see. I don't yeah. know. We've talked about it. Um, I think we would be happy. We're happy right now with our two girls and then we'll see in the future if we try for a third. We don't know. <laughs> to, uh, to be continued, maybe. Um, yes. you, right around the time that Jessica got married, you met Jeremy. Your family obviously was de dealing with a terrible crisis. How do you all come together in time of crisis? Mm. I think it looks differently for us, maybe because we're so far away. Mm -hmm. I know um, all of my family there in Arkansas, everyone lives kind of closer to each other, but for us, we're far away. And so whenever we've walked through those challenging times, I think that um, for me personally, it's just, it's been so tough to walk through, but at the same time, I just lean on um, the Lord, lean on Jeremy, on our community. They've really helped us through. And so I'm really grateful for all of that support. Really. I mean, you open up about your brother, Josh, in the book, saying it was one of the hardest realities in your life when you realized that your brother was living a lie. I mean, how does one even come to terms with that and process something like that, that you think you know somebody for so many years and then you don't? Mm -hmm. That's been one of the hardest things. I think it is difficult to like even discuss it. Um, but what I will say is that I am grateful for the justice system and grateful that justice is being served um, with my brother and my heart just breaks for the victims and their families. Um, and so, yeah, that that season, all of these challenges and these trials, it makes me lean harder on my faith in God and not put a trust, not put any trust in a man or in a person because people will always let us down and fail us. And it's, you can look at something like that and say, how in the world is this possible? How could this have happened? And 
um, it just takes so much time to work through in your mind and process everything. Um, and at the same time, I see that Jesus is kind and he's trustworthy and I can run to him and he will never let me down. So that's where I turn in times like that. Yeah. You said that you haven't spoken to him in two years. Does it almost feel like you're in a mourning period as well? Since like, obviously, like I said, like this isn't the person that you know, but you still say that you still pray for him. So, I mean, you know, how do you feel about him now? And then is it is, is it almost like a mourning period for you? It's definitely been so tough and so sad, I think, because it's my brother mm -hmm. and that's not easy. Um, so it, it has taken many years, um, to process all of that. And at the same time, when I say I pray for my brother, I pray that he will even, um, just repent and turn to Jesus because there's always forgiveness. And at the same time, I think that it's, I'm grateful that justice is being served and that's what is necessary and it's best. And so I just continue to pray that his heart will be changed. And I think even writing this book, it also makes me realize, okay, this is more of a, there's more of a need for this because you can put on an outward front of who you say you are. It's easy with these principles. You can put it up and say, this is who I am. But unless your heart is changed from the inside out, then it has to be real. It has to be genuine from the inside out. It's not just putting on an outward front. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what my heart is um, in all of that. Definitely. You know, you, you write that you wanted to step away from reality TV. You didn't want your daughters to grow up on reality TV. Do you ever regret doing reality TV then? You know, I look at those years and I'm really grateful for the opportunities that I was able to have. Like we traveled the world, things that we wouldn't have been able to do as like a large family, you know? Um, and at the same time, I can say like, I saw also those challenges, um, like I just mentioned, walking through the hardest seasons of my life mm -hmm. in the public eye and needing to give an answer. Um, that was, that was tough. And so, um, I think for our girls, we talked about it for a while, even before we had kids and whether or not we wanted them in the public eye. And we decided just to keep them out of the public eye and let them choose what they want to do. And so that's just been our decision. And we'll sometimes post pictures of the back of their heads or little videos and you can hear their little voices or whatever, but not showing their faces um, has been something that we're planning on sticking to. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you, will you ever let them watch the show maybe later on? Yeah. Yeah. I, I let them watch the show. I think because it, it was such a huge part of my life. I, I spent most of my life on TV. Mm -hmm. And so even in this process, like I've had a couple crews come in the house and it's really funny. My two-year-old, she'll be like playing in her playroom, pop out and look and she'll see cameras and be scared. She's like, what is this? <laughs> and I thought, huh, how interesting. That was my childhood. Like that was all I knew. I play with the boom mics and all of that, but she's just so not used to it. So it's kind of interesting to see. Yeah. You know, obviously your daughters are so young and you have a ways to go, but what does their like courtship look like? Does that even, or is that even not even in your vocabulary anymore? Mm. I think that the more I look at the purity culture and all of that, I think that the Bible's clear about what purity is before marriage. Um, but as far as the specifics, it's not nailed down. Like you can't go on a date with someone um, without a chaperone. You know, you can't kiss before you're married. You can't hold hands, like all the rules. I don't see that in the word of God. And so I want my girls to um, hopefully just, I mean, sometimes things are trial and error. I want to equip them for life and give them the best possible lives that I can and point them to the word of God. And then at the end of the day, I think that they will grow and mature. And um, I don't think that courtship is a word that we're going to use with them at all, because um, I don't think that that's 
the only way to find a spouse or the best way at all. Yeah, definitely. I know during your courtship, you said that like you were a little unsure that Jeremy was the person that you wanted to marry and, you know, a little intimidated by him. But when did all that change? And when did you realize like, this is my person? Mm. Yeah, Jer came on the scene. And I think my hesitation was mainly because of him being outside of my world and that can be a fearful thing when you're in that culture. And so I had such confidence though. I remember coming back and telling my mom, I feel so safe with him. Like he's, he is everything that I've ever wanted. And he wasn't in our setting, which is just crazy to think about. Um, but he loved God and he was committed to the word of God and lived his life according to it. And that's where I found, okay, this guy is, he's an awesome guy. It's, exactly what I wanted. Yeah, that's so great. And you and I are almost in the same boat. My daughter's almost four, my son's almost two. So it's, it, we're in it right now. But what, <laughs> in the what are the biggest it. parenting challenges that you guys are facing at the moment? You know, I think it's just Evie is um, still at this stage where she likes to scream because she can only say so many words. Mm-hmm. The past week, she's been trying to put together sentences, but it's like, oh, lo, 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 cereal. And so... <laughs> It's really cute, but it's also challenging because she screams um, a lot. And so we're just like, okay, where's your passy? Like, let's get your passy ASAP. So it's really cute. Like that's the stage we're in until she can talk. But Felicity is just so much fun, super smart, Mm -hmm. um, super outgoing and an artist. She'll paint for an hour straight. She loves it. I love that. And do you have like, I know that you live far away from some family members, but do you guys do like, uh, like FaceTimes together to like FaceTime play dates and things like that? (laughs) Yes. It's really cute. Felicity knows that she has a lot of cousins now, but she doesn't quite understand like who all is her cousin. She called, um, Gideon, my sister, Joy's little one. He came to visit a while back and she called him her brother. And I said, no, it's not your brother, it's your cousin. And so she's like, oh, okay, but I had another cousin, Ivy. And I'm like, yeah, you have so many cousins. It's just hard to keep up with. Yeah, so I think she doesn't quite understand. And when we go back and see everyone, it's it's confusing for her because mm-hmm. she does not get to see them every day. But FaceTime helps, um, family group messages definitely help. Definitely. Well, Ginger, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on the book. And like you said, that you hope this helps a lot of people and I'm sure it definitely will. Thank you, Christina. It's wonderful talking to you again. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye. For more news content and exclusive interviews, make sure to hit the sub, like, and bell button down below and visit usmagazine.com.